All right, we are live here on the Meat Mafia podcast today, joined by Dr. Kate Shanahan. And this morning I texted Salazzo and my phone auto-corrected your last name to Shanaham, which I think is actually really appropriate for the Meat Mafia podcast. I like that. <laughs> I approve of your phone. <laughs> my phone knows something that, that we don't. It's just a little bit smarter than us. And I, I think <laughs> that nickname might have to stick, honestly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love pork, so and I and and I wouldn't mind being a ham, like you know. <laughs> what is your uh, Dr. K? What's your what's your favorite animal based product? Would you say cream cheese? Oh gosh, I don't know. Between the two of those, I guess I'd have to pick cheese because it's just so diverse. Yeah, yeah. You you can do basically anything with a good, like a dynamic range of cheeses. There's so many of them. I mean, people have been making cheese for thousands of years and um, it's like the unsung hero of humanity. You know, people talk about fire, the wheel. I think cheese belongs up there, you know, with gun steel, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like all of Europe and most of it, much of Asia owes its existence to the ability to store milk during, you know, the, the colder when cows aren't lactating thanks to cheese is really mm. was hugely cheese-based <laughs> the diets of uh of a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of societies uh up, you know up until right through the middle ages really <laughs> I, I feel like that runs in the face of what a lot of people today would think with all the, like the dairy conversations today being you know you're dairy intolerant or or what have you yeah, that's kind of why I brought it up, actually, because um, in doing the research for my first book, Deep Nutrition, I really wanted to answer the question of like, what did humans eat? You know, like, is there any common elements? And one of the uh, common elements was fresh food and fermented food. And, and cheese is both of those. Right. Um, and but, I, you know, I found that like. Uh, dairying uh, and herding. Right. We talk about hunter gathering and then we talk about farming. But in between there was herder gathering mm -hmm. and hugely 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 all around uh you know a, a, a northern asia um the cons of uh you, you know that basically kept sacking rome and stuff they lived off of meat and milk mm. yeah it's incredible the, there's a yeah and it, africa in africa the maasai live off live off of um milk and blood mostly and occasional meat. I mean, it, 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 back in the day, now they live off junk food, like the rest of us, <laughs> but yeah. It's yeah. interesting. The, the milk story is one, I'm actually diving into a book called the untold story of milk right now. And they talk about how there's a lot of, there's like 70 something biblical references to milk and how it's <laughs> is th this amazingly rich nutrient source for these shepherds who are considered the healthiest people uh, in, in these communities, which, you know, is, is not talked about in the conversation today, I'm sure. No, I know. I, I know it's crazy uh, because like dairy's got this rap of being inflammatory. And mm -hmm. the only reason people, um, I think the main reason people are confused about what's really inflammatory is because of seed oils mm. sliding into that conversation. If we want to go there. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. And just to, just to take a step back, just so you know, I mean, this episode is, is special for the both of us, just because we started our podcast about two and a half months ago. And one of the things that we did is we made a list of like 10 guests that really influenced the way that we think about food, nutrition, lifestyle. And you were right at the top of that list. Like Deep Nutrition is a book that we recommend to everyone that wants to start to dive down this rabbit hole because you were really the first person that started talking about the way your, you know, your genes are, you know, are able to influence by the nutrition that you're putting into your body. Um, and I think you, we were saying offline, you were talking about seed oil since 2002. So this stuff has really gotten popularized the last couple of years, but it's because of trailblazers like you that were doing all this research and experimentation. So number one, we wanted to thank you. But what we learned in deep nutrition was that it was actually your experiences as a track athlete at Cornell that kind of got you down the rabbit hole. So would you mind just telling your story a little bit for the audience? Because that would be great. 
Yeah, so I'm a family medicine medical doctor, and I had uh, wanted to <clears throat> uh, be a biochemist so I could um, understand genetically what was wrong with people like me who suffered from recurring soft tissue, connective tissue injuries like shin splints and tendonitis and um, all kinds of like just chronic injuries from running because I was a cross country athlete and I, I was back in the day, I was really good. Like I, I actually qualified for the Olympic trials um, in 1980. So I was a serious athlete, but these injuries kept getting in my way. So I wanted to do something about it. And I, I was hoping that going into biochemistry and genetics at Cornell would get to the bottom, but it mm. didn't. So I left that scene because actually it just became GMOs, right? This was even before GMOs were a thing, but I was looking like, it was looking like I just didn't like the direction it was headed. And I just, it made me feel icky inside. So I left and I wanted to go to medical school. And I was like, maybe I'll get to the underlying cause of health conditions there because it was, uh, you know, sports medicine that really diet kept on. I kept going back to sports medicine. So I wanted to be a great sports medicine doctor and really be able to help people with these things, with these chronic recurring issues as, as athletes. Um, and because that's where my heart is, right? I love being active and I love it. You know, people, humans, are designed to be athletes. We are like other animals, truly athletic creatures. We're not the same kind of athletes as other animals. We can't run as fast or jump as high, but we are still amazing athletes. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to be able to support that. And in medical school, I was just like, I was like, this isn't gonna happen here either because we don't get to the underlying causes of these things. And the rest of my training didn't really help that either. So. Yeah. Um, so I was uh, just a family medicine doctor and practicing happily-ish, kind of like disillusioned already after two years, like, hmm. oh gosh, I prescribe pills and I'm not really helping anyone. And people seem to get on more and more pills. And how do I know they're really working? And we have all this research, but it seems like it's marginal benefits at the best. Like you have to give something like uh, 2000 people a statin for one to benefit. And what are, meanwhile, what are the harms? You know, statins are the cholesterol lowering drug. So I was like kind of floundering around and wondering what was going to happen if I was going to make it till retirement. And when I actually got really, really injured myself this time and uh, to get myself well, nothing, it wasn't just a soft connective, uh, connective tissue injury this time, like a, all my other injuries, it was much more serious. I had to, I, I had an immune system problem and I had a common virus become like take over my nervous system. And so I had trouble walking and I couldn't even walk. And I was having a hard time practicing because of that. And it was terrible. And there was like nothing, no one could help me. Nobody knew what was wrong with me. Right. So I was a doctor going through the medical system, kind of like trying all the usual things that I would send people through and nothing helped. Right. So I'm sure You've spoken about this numerous times with people who have similar stories. And the answer was found in nutrition, but this was 2001. So there wasn't hardly anything online. And um, there was no online. Actually, there was Google like didn't even exist, <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think. Um, and uh, I remember looking on Yahoo and stuff and there, Amazon didn't even ship books to where I was in Hawaii. And all they did was books. I don't know if you kids remember that. There was a time <laughs> when only they only sold books. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I was really on my own and, um, I ran into, uh, the concept of essential fatty acids, reading about them in a book by this guru from the 1990s named Andrew Weil. He was Andrew Weil is like, um, if people have never heard of him, he's, he's, uh, he's an interesting character. Um, and, but he really, uh, sparked off this alternative health movement, like single-handedly. Um, he sells a lot of supplements and stuff that I wouldn't recommend, but, but the idea was what you eat matters, your nutrition matters. And that's what resonated with me. And he taught me this, this, this term essential fatty acids that I had never heard of. And I had just done my training and it was a biochemical thing. And I was a biochemistry nerd. So it, mm -hmm. it rekindled my biochemistry, made me tingly all over. Um, with biochemistry possibilities again. And so I, I dove into that and that turned into understanding that seed oils are toxic and they are the number one enemy of our health. Mm. But I like, I also wanted to know a lot more things before I could like write a book. I wanted to know what people are really supposed to eat. And so 
uh, it took me years of researching to ultimately uh, figure like all those things out. And, and that's what deep nutrition was at the, uh, in 2008, it's been uh, republished and a little bit, quite a bit uh, expanded in 2017. So the updated version has all that and that story, but that's like my origin story is really, I was trying to get to the underlying root cause of, uh, connective tissue disorders. And not only did I find, I find that it was, I found that it was like multifactorial. That's a fancy doctor word when there's more than one cause, multiple factors. Mm. Um, we say things like that just to make us sound like feel technical and smart. <laughs> um, but it, it's, uh, so it wasn't just the seed oils. It was also the lack of nutrition. Mm. And, and that's what I kind of really discovered when I was doing the research for deep nutrition, which was that not only are we getting sick because of this toxin that no one really was, nobody was paying attention to in 2001. And still it's kind of under the radar. Um, but we also are very deficient in nutrients because we have no clue what a healthy human diet is mm -hmm. because we ignored all the most important nutrition science that was available to us. Mm. And we basically just reimagined what nutrition should be starting in the 1940s. And it was, that's not the way to do it. Like nutrition and new and improved are a bad combination because nutrition is based on nature mm. and new and improved. So implies we're improving on nature, which I think is an impossibility. Mm. So, uh, right. So, so it's like off the bat, it was wrong. So the two things that, that was, uh, that had made me sick, one was the toxins and sugar is a toxin too, but seed oils are the worst. And the other deficit, uh, was that my diet was very deficient in one of the four pillars of the human diet, uh, that I defined, uh, when I did the research for deep nutrition, which is, um, the pillar that's missing, I call it the uh, meat on the bone pillar. Mm. And what that does is it gets you nutrition that supports healthy connective tissue growth. And mm. you really need that from infancy. Actually, you really need your parents to have had this. And uh, what it really it translates to most we now know is bone broth, right? Bone mm. broth. Yeah. Um, use your bones and joint material, and you get a lot of collagen and collagen building materials. And mm. without that in my diet as a child, and with my parents kind of lacking that in their own diets as children, I was like two generations deprived of this stuff. And while both of my parents have amazing connective tissue, I mean, my dad is 80. And he's still, he's more active than I am because his connective tissue is so healthy. Mm. All of us in this level, like this next generation, the third generation away from proper human nutrition, uh, we all have, you know, major joint issues. And, uh, you know, that that's, it was preventable. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and so now, like, even if I do follow, you know, a perfect human diet, I still can't rebuild stuff that should have been built right when I was a teenager. So there's all these elements of our health that are in, that are influencing how people today are experiencing life and how, and, and that are, that are causing all these different diseases and mm -hmm. new health problems and millennials having, uh, health problems starting at age 27, their health starts to decline. And that's a, out of a report by um, a new news report by um, Blue Cross and Blue Shield. They said at mm. age 27, that's basically age 65. When I was growing up has become age 27. That's unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, Dr. K, one of the things that came to mind when, when you were just talking there is the second part of your title, which is why your genes it's why your genes need traditional food, which I think is, um, it, it brings to, to the forefront, like what is traditional foods? Because I think the modern food system has made it very hard to see what's real and what's fake. Um, whereas 
you know, I, I think your work kind of speaks directly to the fact that, you know, we need to be going back to eating these traditional foods that we, we were eating for centuries and, and through our evolution. So I, I think uh, if you wouldn't mind speaking to that second part of your title, I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, so it's uh, the it's deep nutrition. Why your genes need traditional food, and mm. what I'm essentially saying is uh, that we are genetically uh, designed to have a certain diet, just the same way that, like for example, horses, right? They need grass. If they don't get grass, they can have hay and barley and other stuff but it's not ever going to be as good as if they're wild roaming the hills of, you know, uh, we think horses evolved um, in uh, Europe. There's controversy over that. Um, like on the steppes of Asia um, in the massive grassland steppes of Asia there. Uh, so similar to, uh, I guess, like Montana a little bit, except a little bit more, a little warmer, uh, a little bit more of a growing season. Um, so lots of grass and they could just roam and migrate and getting the freshest, newest, healthiest grass, best tasting for a horse grass, um, that they wanted. Right. So that's a horse diet. Well, people have a, have a similar genetic requirement that if we don't get our genes don't perform properly. And that impacts our every cell in our body and it impacts our genetic potential for health, it impacts our growth, it impacts what we look like, and uh, it impacts, the, because it impacts the way our bones grow. And it impact, for example, if we don't get enough uh, vitamins and protein in utero and as children, then we will be more likely to need glasses um, because our eyes won't develop properly, there won't be enough vitamin A for the retina to develop properly. Yeah. And there are abnormalities that you can see that eye doctors see and they look for, and they, they see when people have, uh, are nearsighted. It's not, it's not just with a lens, it's a fundamental misgrowth of the eyeball, inclu including the retina and the fovea. Mm. It's all weird looking. When they look back in the back of your eye, it does not even look normal. Looks normal kind of out on the front, but it doesn't look normal in the back. Um, and, uh, also what happens very commonly now is that the jaw doesn't grow enough. And so we either get crooked teeth or we have to have a bunch of teeth pulled. I had to have a bunch of teeth pulled and these all have health consequences that can be very severe. Uh, you can get sleep apnea. And as a child, if you have sleep apnea, your IQ is going to be lowered for the rest of your life. So these are, you know, th this is what happens. It's serious consequences happen. I'm just giving you an idea of mm -hmm. like the profound ability of nutrition to change our quality of life, change our experience of life, change, you know, like how tall we get, who, who's like available for dating, right? Because there's yeah. these theories of like, you end up with a number that's your number, right? If you're an eight, you're going to end up with an eight, right? All that, right? <laughs> You've seen that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the, the science of dating, well, it's related to the science of nutrition and the science of genetics. And so it's um, the name for this way of thinking about nutrition. There's actually a name for it. I didn't really invent it. It's an ancestral approach. Mm. The philo it's a philosophy, really. The philosophy is simple. We should eat what our ancestors ate because that's what our genes expect, right? Mm. Um, that's my interpretation of the, of the ancestral health movement. And the ancestral health movement included uh, people like Rob Wolf and Mark Sisson who were talking about the paleo diet and the primal diet. Um, and there's also an ancestral health society uh, mm. where they, they kind of align with these ideas. But that's the approach, right? So that's the approach. And it's very, very different from what I learned in medical school, which was, um, you know, if, if, it, uh, if it's not backed by a double blinded randomized trial, then it's not a valid thought about nutrition science. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, totally. What you're saying about genes is literally blowing our minds because I think that there's, it, no, it seriously is because there, I think there's this misconception that 
you I like I, I think about that book mindset by Carol Dweck where there's like a fixed mindset and a growth mindset and I think a lot of people yeah. think about that with their genes it's just you know you, your genes you this it's a genetic lottery you get what you get you can't really influence it so I can just load my body with processed food and my kids will be unaffected by that but you're literally saying that the inputs of what you're putting into your body are going to affect your kids your grandkids etc so that totally just changes the incentives of how you should be thinking about living your life right Yes, you would you would think that it that um, that it would yes and uh, unfortunately it lacks a little bit of power because it's not really reinforced when when you go out there and in the medical society right I mean it should right this should be common knowledge this should be what doctors learn um, and uh, like I got a lot of fantastic information from a book also written by a doctor, he's a doctor of dentistry and um, dental surgery named Weston A. Price. He wrote a book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And like that book blew my mind because he was the one that really first um, nailed down the connection between nutrition and physical form. That's why the subtitle of his, well, no, that was the title. The title of his book is Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Like, mm -hmm wow, that's totally a, uh, a, a you know, a, a, a nihilistic almost like title, right? Like, um, <laughs> uh, if you don't eat right, you're just a degenerate. Yes. <laughs> basically what he's saying. But like, that's sort of, tr that is basically true. You know, you're not, a, you're, you've lost a potential that you had. And have you lost it forever? Could it be regained? Nobody knows. We don't know. Hopefully. Like there's reason to be hopeful, but Dr. it's going to take a lot of work. You started your book off with a, a tribute to John Doyle and you sort of go through the step, like this story, this anecdote of multi-generational health problems. I thought it was a great way to start the book because it really just frames everything exactly through this. Hey, your genes are your genes, your kids' genes, their kids' genes are all kind of at play with what you're putting in your body. Um, I'd be curious to get your take on what the inspiration was for including that at, at the beginning of the book. Yeah, so what it was, was um, it was really almost like a cry for help um, because, you know, I had published the first edition of Deep Nutrition and I really wanted people to um, take up the banner and like other doctors to take up the banner and, and like help their patients. Mm. Um, but that didn't happen, right? Because I mean, it was a dream I had, it was my mission, but it didn't happen. And so when I was asked by a publisher to you know expand the 2008 edition to 2017 edition, I, I started out by, by saying, hey, look, folks, um, doctors are a source of health misinformation and it makes people sick. And the story of John Doyle includes an example of that because he was on a drug, one of my two least favorite drugs, actually the top of top two, the top of the two, number one, least favorite drug, statins, cholesterol lowering drugs. He was on one. And I think that is ultimately what really, you know, was the final blow and killed him. He died of an infection. That was a complication of a surgery that he wouldn't have had had he grown up on a healthy traditional diet and you know was lived a seed oil free life and and all all of this stuff because this the surgery that he needed was a compli was due to other complications of other surgeries like it's just the medical mm -hmm. system gets so rich off of all of these diseases that people are developing and and that's why the it was really like a cry for help. It's like, Hey guys, you know, we got a, uh, doctors, like I was asking, really, I was asking doctors for help there. And, and, um, you know, like let's do better for our patients, please than this. And, um, I think it kind of worked because the doctors who read that book, they, they say it really impacted them. Um, mm. so, um, yeah. So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy about that. I'm proud of that. I think, I think it struck home because I think a lot of doctors see this, you know, once they, once they, um, start thinking that way of like, you know, one thing leads to the other, to the other, to the other. Um, it's not that people's physiologies are just defective, right? It's not that humanity is this 
species that's just prone to chronic diseases because, uh, well, because I guess it's with our own fault, we sit around and watch, we have too much screen time and we choose to eat too much dessert, um, right? Like that's, mm-hmm. that's what mm-hmm. the thinking is, but it's much deeper than that. And, and medical doctors uh, have a lot of power to fix a lot of it. And that's really what I wanted. I mean, that was my secret audience. Like I wanted it to be empowering for anyone, but especially doctors. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Kate, one of the things you mentioned when we first started recording is that you started going down the seed oil rabbit hole, 2001, 2002, I think the time frame was. And within the last two years, particularly on Twitter and this ancestral health community, the concept of seed oils and their pervasiveness in Western society has definitely become much more mainstream. Um, would you mind just giving a quick one-on-one on seed oils and why, you know, why the average consumer should care about them and how harmful they actually are to the, to your metabolic health? Yeah. So a seed oils, for example, so you can get your head wrapped around what am I, what am I talking about? Um, they're oils that are squeezed in a factory uh, out of little tiny seeds. And there's eight that by my best estimation of the science are toxic. So mm-hmm. that's corn, canola, cotton seed, soy, sunflower, safflower, rice bran, and grape seed oil. And they are toxic because they have fatty acids that are unstable and all the processing that happens in the factory mangles them and turns them into toxins. And then we mangle them some more when we cook with them. And then when we eat them in the amounts that we do now, these unstable fatty acids build up in our bodies in ways that completely destroy our metabolism. Mm. So what that's, I, maybe that answers why you should care. They completely destroy your metabolism. Um, and so, and so the, the deep nutrition like talks about the two opposites of nutrition, like Processed food, what is that? And seed oils are the number one ingredient in processed food that makes processed food toxic. The other two categories are the refined carbohydrates like sugar and flours, refined flours, and protein powders, which I don't talk about a lot, but really should be talked about a lot more. Mm. Um, and and then the the opposite is like the the four pillars of the human diet, which you know that's what deep nutrition really is. That's our ancestral diet. It includes that meat on the bone and, uh, you know, three other pillars. Um, but then the fat burn fix is where I, uh, doing the research for the fat burn fix is where I really came to understand the role of seed oils in driving the obesity epidemic and making weight gain inevitable, but not just weight gain. It's really when you are eating seed oils, you are developing type two diabetes. And that's what makes you overeat and gain weight. So it's kind of flips the paradigm on its head. It's not that we over, we overeat, get fat and then get type two diabetes. Um, and that, which is what, you know, still is kind of the prevalent, um, thinking in medicine and even in the fairly, you know, higher level thinking, um, low carb community. But what I'm saying is that it's seed oils that are driving insulin resistance and that drives overeating. And so we have a different kind of obesity now, and people are really trapped in this metabolic downward spiral that only that is not easy to get out of once you Mm. get to a certain point. And uh, I wrote the fat burn fix because so many people were having problems doing a keto diet because they were so metabolically damaged. They couldn't cut their carbs. They actually had a physiologic need now for sugar and just going cold Turkey like that is actually harmful for folks like that. Um, it, or it, and depending how damaged you are, it's actually harmful. But if you're only medium damaged, it doesn't solve your problems even close. Mm -hmm. And right now, you know, we have people talking about, oh, well, that's just the low carb flu, just push past it, but it is not the low carb flu. So that's what I'm talking Mm -hmm. about. When you get low carb flu, that means you're metabolically damaged. And I'm not sure you really should be just doing keto just yet. And that's why I needed to write the book because I wanted to make, help people get out of that, um, vicious downward metabolic Mm -hmm. cycle. And, And it takes a step by step approach. You can't just, oh, I'm going to cut carbs. You can though. I'm going to just cut seed oils, Mm. right? If there's any, just one thing, you don't want to read a book. 
if you just cut seed oils, if you can manage to do that, then you will experience massive health benefits. What is it specifically about seed oils that are causing the metabolic dysfunction or the insulin resistance in the body? They're, they promote inflammation. So, you know, we have all these folks running around saying dairy is inflammatory, lectins are inflammatory. No, seed oils are inflammatory. There's nothing inherently unhealthy about dairy. Certainly, I mean, it is literally the milk of human nutrition. <laughs> uh, that, that it's just that we get most of it now from other mammals because they're much more productive. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's not bad to be eating another species milk. I wouldn't recommend it for infants without modification, but as adults, it's not inherently inflammatory. It just is mm. not, there's no evidence that it is. It's just been stated so often that, um, people believe it. And then they, they find research that supports their thinking, but that's not the truth. The it's the seed oils that are promoting 90% of the inflammation and inflammation driven diseases that people suffer from because only seed oils are not food. That's the only not food that we actually eat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like all food is good, <laughs> yeah. especially, you know, even plants because we've cultivated them. A lot of folks say that plants have anti-nutrients and that's why in the carnivore community, they avoid them. And that's true. Plants did not ever evolve with the idea that they should be eaten. That's not their goal in life. Their goal in life is to be a happy plant and reproduce and have lots of little plant seeds um, and be surrounded by their grandchildren <laughs> if yeah. they're perennials. But, um, but the, um, the plants that we eat have been cultivated for so many thousands of generations. They have very minimal. And mm. also the cooking methods and the processing methods, the, the, um, uh, the way that people used to prepare beans, for example, reduced the anti-nutrients even further. And we should still be doing that. And that's what's in deep nutrition too, is how to reduce anti-nutrients in plants that, are, that can be really good for you if you like them. Dr. K, what, um, I'm just, it's interesting because I feel like there've been a couple big influencers in the paleo space that have almost shifted their tune a little bit and have gravitated more to that ketogenic diet, maybe just higher in saturated fat or animal protein. Yeah. Um, with, with that being said, I've noticed, like I've done paleo before, I've done keto. I do feel like personally with my stomach, with colitis, cutting out a lot of those cruciferous vegetables, beans, legumes, et cetera, it's, that's been great for my gut health. Um, are, there, are there vegetables that maybe you will incorporate in your diet or things that you tend to avoid? Like just how do you think about that? Yeah. So let's talk about vegetables. So how much do you really need? Well, we over, we force feed, we tell people that they're so good for you that we tend to overeat them. I mean, it's, it's, people have two salads a day. That's a lot. And, um, you know, I, uh, I think that, uh, vegetables are great. We don't need to avoid them. Uh, but if they're upsetting your stomach, you should avoid them, especially if you have, an altered digestive system, right? Like if you have a colitis, you may lack enzymes now that mm. other people don't lack, right? So you have a different situation. Um, you're not at, at, uh, right now, and these enzymes can and do come back in some people, uh, mm. but right now you are you just may not simply be able to eat everything out there and you shouldn't, mm. but you should notice it, right? Like I've heard, I've worked with people who had never had a problem with dairy and were told that it was inflammatory and cut it out of their diet and then developed profound osteoporosis in their twenties. Wow. And, and one of them was the professional athlete and the injury he suffered ended pretty much essentially ended his career a few years later because he never recovered. It was, it crushed a nerve and he never recovered. Wow. Yeah. So it's harmful advice to, to just willy nilly tell people not to eat dairy, but getting back to vegetables, I'm sorry. Um, the best way to consume vegetables is fermented, right? So hmm. but if you think about it, um, you know, when, when we started, so first we were hunter gatherers, right? Let's go back to the ancestral philosophy and start really from 
the beginning where we were hunter gatherers and probably ate mostly meat as humans, right? Before that we were monkeys and gorillas and we ate a lot of non-meats, but, um, but then there, like all the evidence suggests that we really had a lot of meat and insects in our diet. And maybe we did gather a few things depending what kind of climate we lived in that came from the vegetable kingdom, but those were mostly gonna be tubers and nuts and, and fruits and not, not be a big part of our day. They, they didn't have lettuce. There was no such thing as broccoli. Um, there were no, there were no the, the, most of the, the vegetables in the grocery store, not part of our human evolution until we started farming, which was much more recently. And most places on the planet where you can farm, you can only farm seasonally. So you're going to need to preserve. How do you do that when you don't have a fridge? How do you do that when you can't always boil and can? There were no cans. You ferment. Mm. Fermentation is a way to store extra for later. And in China, for example, um, they kimchi buried in the ground. Very simple. They grew cabbage. They did a few things. Some of the stuff is lost to history. But they, they like mixed in some stuff for flavor to there was like essentially there was like a starter culture that um, they may have used that was actually fermented like fish. Um, mix that in, buried it in the ground during the winter, let it ferment all winter long. In the spring, sometimes sometimes in the winter when they would get hungry, they would pull it out of the ground and eat it, but it would be fermenting and it would ferment at different ages. It's edible at all ages, kimchi is. Um, and so that that's really our early relationship with vegetables was mostly based on fermentation when yeah. it comes to like the leafy vegetables. And when it comes to things like tubers and stuff, we, we've had to do a lot of work to make them edible. And since then um, we have not done that work, but we've almost let the plants do that work. Like potatoes used to be pretty toxic. The yeah. potatoes um, were discovered first cultivated in um, cent central and South America uh, by the Incas and or the Aztec. There are these mean little tubers, like about the size of a golf ball when, when they were really big. And the people figured out that to make them edible, you had to do this massive amount of work, including soaking them in a running flowing stream for like six days <laughs> and then freeze drying them in the al altitude in the mountain and turning them into a powder. I mean, they did so much work to make these things edible, right? So that's our relationship with vegetables. It's kind of, <laughs> they, it wasn't love at first sight, <laughs> put it that way. Um, except maybe with things like fruit, but even our fruit is so much more sugary. Um, and honey is not a vegetable, it's a carb. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's an animal product actually. So, so yeah, vegetables have a role in our diet, but we exaggerate the role in this country because we just hear, never hear anything bad about them, right? Because the dietitians and everybody said, you need to have six servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Like there are some sort of, right. you could live on them almost, but no, you can't. They're devoid of protein and somewhat difficult to digest. Dr. Kate, what are your thoughts on the dietary guidelines? What, what would you change uh, specifically about them? Well, I would change everything. There's nothing <laughs> good about them. <laughs> the greatest lie ever told <laughs> yeah i mean well i mean you can kind of get a sense because they keep changing right like the, how does our need for nutrition change in my generation my in my lifespan has changed like four times already mm, that's a really interesting point <laughs> <laughs> so like if this is the best our science can do maybe our science sucks and we ought to look at a much more successful history, like a, something with a much better track record. Mm. And that is what I did with deep nutrition. I just looked at, you know, what do all traditional cuisines have in common? That's the track record folks that we need to be following traditional cuisine. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did all have four things in common. One of the things that's fallen out of the food pyramid is organ meats. And you mentioned that as one of your pillars for these traditional foods. Is, is that something that you think that people need to be incorporating back into their diet? If you want to be totally healthy, you absolutely need to try and um, develop a taste for some sort of an organ meat. Like, and liver is one of the most nutritious. And of course it has, ideally, it will be from a healthy animal, you know, species appropriate diet, pasture and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, liver uh, and other organs, bone marrow is another one that may have really a fundamental role. 
um, in, in our health and because it has some unique fatty acids that you really don't get anywhere else in the diet. They're branched chain fatty acids that may actually stimulate our immune system properly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we may need those. So uh, the fat of the marrow, right? So not the stuff that you make bone broth with, that's actually protein. Um, but but uh, yes, organ meats are common to all traditional diets. There is no traditional diet that excludes organ meats. Mm. Um, you know, whether you're talking about people in Alaska or Hawaii or Africa or Asia or China or France or Japan, everywhere but in America, um, people regularly consume organ meats. And we don't really have a traditional diet here in America. That's our problem. That's why we lead the world um, in chronic disease because we never really had that foundation of a strong belief in a culin in any kind of culinary principles because we were a melting pot from the beginning. And the first thing to go are, um, it seems, are uh, traditional food ways. Right, like you want to see what your neighbors are eating, or or you don't want to eat stuff that's hard to eat, or you're not growing it yourself. So, so we really were kind of a setup in this country to just have to trust the government to tell us what to eat because we really did not have, you know, we had we had people from Germany marrying people from Asia. Who's going to win that battle about cuisine there? Right, they're just going to want to do, they're just want to eat, eat pizza. So, because that's why, that's what the cool kids are eating. So yeah. that's, that's kind of our problem is that, um, you know, we didn't have a strong root in any kind of cuisine. As great as we are as, as a country, you know, in many other ways, we totally suck in terms of tradition, in terms of food and, and knowing the first thing about what a healthy diet looks like. And yet we are the ones now telling the world what to eat. We're defining a healthy diet for the world. We are the ones that said saturated fat is unhealthy. And we've exported that, um, that mythology, nutrition mythology around the world. And now you have the everywhere we, it, people are believing that saturated fat is unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Crazy, huh? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is crazy. And, and back to the, the organs and the liver that you were talking about for someone that is maybe new to organ meats and they're trying to figure out how to incorporate it. Do you like things like the desiccated capsules as a as like a bridge or maybe like freezing it and chopping it into little pieces? Like what is your preferred way to incorporate them into your diet? I would say try to find a recipe that you like. And, and as with children, you will develop more of a taste for it if you don't overeat it and force yourself to eat when you're sick of it. Mm -hmm. It takes children about 10 to 12 times before they will actually develop a taste for something. Mm -hmm. So give yourself that same kind of leeway um, and, and keep looking for a recipe that doesn't disgust you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I hate to put it that way, but um, I actually, my husband now finally found a way of making liver that I actually look forward to. I really like it. It still hits me in the beginning with this like liver flavor, but after the first bite i'm like oh this is so good and he breads it he, he like it's not really bread he he dredges it in in flour and white flour right so this is part of my philosophy is that white flour is a processed food but it does have some uses right if you can make liver taste delicious with a like a cup a tablespoon or two of white flour per meal then use it it's mm. like the song a spoonful of medicine helps the wait no that's wrong yeah. <laughs> full of sugar <laughs> helps the medicine go down <laughs> i'm not good at singing <laughs> no it's 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 a great it's a great song and so you're kind of saying the dose is really what makes the poison where which i think is actually a good point because i think you do see that a lot on social media as people telling you to just avoid sugar and you know refined grains and flour and things like that at all costs but what you're saying is like look, the nutritional benefits of incorporating organ meats are fantastic. And if you need a tablespoon of flour to make it tastier and use that as a delivery mechanism, then, then it's all good. You should use that and go for it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. There's a lot of great culinary uses for flour. Like you can make a roux with it. I mean, who doesn't love mac and cheese? Mm -hmm. Well, real mac and cheese is includes just a little bit of flour that you cook on high heat with butter and make this 
wonderfully aromatic thing called a roux. And mm. that is an emulsifier that helps the milk and the cheese blend together so mm. that when you make mac and cheese, it's mostly just this delicious mixture of milk and cheese that's been thickened with a tiny bit of flour. And you can have, also you can have actual noodles, but you can make mac and cheese with like um, chickpeas. <laughs> be good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what's Dr. Kate, what's your experience like in the kitchen? Are you, do you like cooking for yourself? Cause that's one of the things that we sort of preach is like cook your own meals. And that will take care of a lot of the, like, as long as it's in your power and you are contributing all the inputs, you're going to be more inclined to make good decisions when it comes to what you're putting in your body. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love experimenting in the kitchen. So does my husband. And so since he, like has more time than I do. He's the one that ends up cooking a lot, but when he can't cook, I just, you know, I, I don't mind stepping up. I, I like it. You know, it's, yeah. to me, it's fun to yeah. see how to just like be the creative part of it is what I like. Um, and, uh, you know, to see if like, oh, with the, does this, I think this would taste good with that, does it? And then when it comes out tasty, you feel like you just discovered this amazing thing. Right. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Dr. Kidd, how do you, th how do you think about um, like the differences or similarities of how men and women should be approaching nutrition? Yeah. So fundamentally nature likes to make it easy. It's a really important question. Is, is, is there that much of a difference between our, our needs? Um, and you know, the answer is no, nature likes to make it easy. There's just like a matter of amounts, right? Like uh, guys get to eat more because there's more, they have more soft tissue. They're usually taller and they require, as far as macros, they, they do require a little bit more protein because you have more protein needs because you are bigger, you have more muscle, you have more bone. And uh, so you just need a little bit more of that stuff. But otherwise it's like the same, right? Like I just, I don't see any way that we could have survived if there was a specific need between sexes, between like age, right? That a five-year-old has totally different needs than a 60-year-old. No, there's, their needs are the same. Their, mm. their, you know, their body does slightly different things with it, which means that you might have more of a tendency to put on fat when you're older than when you're younger, if you eat the same amount and you're, you know, but your body does different, slightly different things with food, but you still have fundamentally the same, the same physiology and the same needs. In fact, all mammals really have the same needs. I mean, cows eat grass, right? So we think cows don't need protein or fat in their diet. Well, guess what? They eat grass, but what gets into their bloodstream is protein and fat because they have six stomachs that convert and, and like trillions and trillions of bacteria that convert the cellulose and all the stuff in the, in the grass into protein and fat, amino acids and fatty acids. Mm -hmm. So we all have really very similar needs, all mammals. Interesting. And one of the things that we've been getting a bit more interested in, we had a guest on yesterday, yesterday, Carlisle Studer, and she was talking about how she's thinking about her future, her kids' future. And one of the chapters in your book is talking about how to create the body or the nutritional habits for the perfect baby. Um, and I think that a lot of people now are dealing with these problems around infertility and um, just not able to actually ha conceive. And I think in your chapter, you talked about that a bit, but also just how to create like the nutritional habits for a healthy baby. Um, I think that's a, a topic a lot of people would be interested in learning more about. Um, so were there a few things that you kind of diluted down to that people should be thinking about when it comes to that? That planning is really key. Like if you want to have a healthy baby, uh, all traditional cultures, planned because if they did not have a healthy baby, the baby would die, right? Their culture would die out. Mm. So one of the things that I learned from Weston Price was that everywhere he went, and he went to 11 isolated places around the world where people had not been influenced yet by civilization, um, they still had their traditional like ways of thinking about food. They required that parents 
basically took classes that, you know, they, they, that would eat, they would have to eat a certain way before they were allowed to have children. And that, that was basically just like focusing on certain really nutritious foods. It's not that they had different needs. It's that they paid more attention to actually getting them, right? Mm -hmm. So they could have been doing that their whole lives and they would have benefited. But if you don't do it, like say, you know, you just don't do it. Like you just don't know, right? Because people didn't know. They didn't, they didn't really have the concept of a government approved diet. They just ate what was around, but they did notice that um, what people ate, bef you know, in the year before pregnancy really impacted how well their baby survived and how well they survived, right? So, um, so people became really keen on uh, pre-pregnancy diets before mm -hmm. even conception. I'm talking about you know, really, truly prenatal, right? Like right now, all we do in this country, we throw a, a vitamin at women, like mostly it's too late by the time they get it. Cause they've already been pregnant for uh, at least, you know, a few weeks before they even know that they're pregnant and right. folic acid, which is the key ingredient in the prenatal vitamin is, is only useful really in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. And many, many women don't even know they're pregnant for the first you know, six, seven, eight weeks and sometimes longer. So that's um, like, that's really the key is planning is key. If you are having a fertility problem, that's your body warning you that you aren't in good shape to make a baby right now, right? Mm. And pay attention to that folks. You need, you don't need like, uh, you know, all kinds of hormones pumped in your body because I mean, science continually shows that that doesn't work very well, um, right? It does, the thing that actually works is keep trying folks. Well, in that time, what happens is very, sometimes people actually improve their nutrition and then they become more fertile. Mm. Um, so that's, that's what I recommend is, is really first and foremost, you really need to know what a healthy diet is. And it's the same for you at, at, when you're, you know, in this pre-pregnancy planning stage, as it is for you when you're going through menopause, if you're a woman and well, you know, when you're re retired, if you're a man, it's the same, same fundamental needs, but there's just certain things that it's really key. You have to really key into because you have not been eating them. If you've been following a standard American diet, and those tend to be foods that are high in cholesterol and hot, the animal fat rich foods like egg yolks and, um, shrimp and, uh, choline rich seafoods, um, stuff like that. Yes, but definitely it's very, very important. And I think it should be part of our, uh, whole conversation around fertility, but it's not, it's, it's, there's many more groups that are just talking about, oh, well, I got this shot and it worked and I got that shot and it worked. Well, no, really what worked is that you just kept trying but you could have actually really improved your child's life. I mean, if someone had told you, this is not your fault. Uh, if someone had told you to just eat better, you would have improved your fertility naturally and not just happen to have a lucky shot and got pregnant and had a preemie that had to be delivered at 22 weeks and barely kept alive. I mean, that's not a great outcome. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, you know, I, I, I think we can do better than that. And I would think that most, most parents would, would, you know, dream of, not that, uh, you know, we have a healthy baby, not a 22 yeah. week premature that they can't, you know, connect with on a human level for mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting to hear you say all this too, because I continue to see more information, just commenting on how like sperm count is the lowest that it's ever been in recorded history and how testosterone rates amongst young men are like decades older than mm -hmm. it should be. And, um, it's, it's interesting and just and just hearing from you that it's like there there is a solution to this this isn't like a, a fixed problem it's like getting the right vitamins and nutrients through your dietary inputs could effectively be correcting all this um, and we're already seeing it right like we both fall into the millennial generation and I have friends that have had you know issues you know giving birth or um, uh, giving yeah giving birth to premature babies and things like that so that's why this I feel like this information is just so valuable to a lot of people and hopefully we can just continue to, to to promote that message and get it out into the world even more so people know that this is an option as opposed to just getting a shot yes absolutely I mean this really is the only I think it's the most humane option uh, you know because I'm not sure too many children would sign up for if they had, if they knew they had the option, like if they were in charge and they could go back and dial back mom's choices, <laughs> I think they might say, Hey, you know, obviously that's like, uh, not a real scenario, but, 
but uh, I do, I, I, because I'm saying this because I have patients who are both parents of former premature children who have learning disorders, who can't get jobs, um, who can only, you know, very, very limited social skills because of, you know, the learning and social disorders. And, and this is what happens, folks. This is, this is the, what you would predict if you were doing an experiment on a species. Don't feed them a species appropriate diet for several generations. Well, they're going to get more and more sickly and have mm. difficulties as, um, as a species. And, and I see the children. I'm a family medicine doctor. I see children. I see pregnant women. I see adults. I see grandparents, how healthy they are um, compared to children these days. And especially compared to, you know, children who were th th that premature child. Yes, sure. Some of them are doing okay. But if you are a 22 week preemie, now an adult, you're going to be struggling. And I've just seen it. I've seen it. And it hurts. It hurts them. It hurts the children. And it hits me. It's like, cause I know this could have been prevented. I know our society did this mm -hmm. to you young yeah. man or young woman now struggling to, you know, keep a job that, you know, because you, you just can't get along with people. And that's usually what I see happening cognitively is that people just have these difficulties with social relations, because that's like one of the most complex cognitive tasks, yeah. social relations. And um, it's, it's, uh, you know, I think it's very related to autism. Autism is an extreme example of that, but there's much more subtle forms of that. And I see a lot of children, now adults, just really struggling. And it, yes, it, it doesn't have to be this way. And we can do something about it. Dr. K, what sort of things would you change? Because the, the system seems like the incentives are just kind of directed in the wrong way, direction. Like you mentioned, like Rogaine and Viagra were two examples of uh, cases where these products were then were initially trying to be used for something else and then they just figured out a new use case for it and they rebranded it and it had like these different effects and so i i see that as like a, an example of like the incentives here just don't really all match up so what sort of solutions do you think about when it comes to changing the medical system well yes i think like there's a lot of concrete ideas like for one i think what i'm doing actually in my job is very visionary of the company that actually hired me they just hired me so I am a doctor and I have some metabolic expertise um, and I can see their patients. I mean, their employees are my patients. They do not have to pay a penny. They can talk to me as long as they need to, as many times as they need to. Mm. Um, and that is the only way that um, medicine can regain its credibility because right now the interest of the hospital system is in conflict with the interest of the patient. The hospital system wants you to be a client. That means you have to get diseases and be sick. Well, when the employer is paying for healthcare, the employer actually is the, is the entity now that has an aligned interest with the patient. The employer doesn't want to have to pay that much for healthcare. The employer doesn't want patients to be sick. And so that's what I do is I, I help my employer and I can consult for companies that want to understand how they can do that themselves. You know, how can they, how hard is it? Can you hire a doctor? There's only a few states you can actually directly hire a doctor in. Okay, so what's the next best thing? So that is actually part of what I can help people with too. Awesome. What, uh, one of the things I was curious about was um, in your book, what, what was your favorite chapter to write? Um, whether it was a topic or just like the easiest one to produce because you were so enthralled by it? Um, I guess I have to say the chapter on good fats and bad because that's really the topic that inspired me to go down this rabbit hole in the first place. And and it's it's the one that gets me the most angry because there's the bad guy is there. And the bad guy is the folks who make us believe that seed oils are healthy and saturated fat is bad. And that's um, the origin of all this comes from one man. Um, and that you, I'm sure you know his name is Ansel Keys. And yeah. so I talk about that and what a, what a bad dude he is. I don't think it was just that he didn't know. I don't give him that. I don't let him off the hook. It's interesting that fats 
so like, like proteins, there aren't really like two categories of like good protein, bad protein, but in fats, there's bad fats and good fats. Um, and I think that creates a ton of confusion for people. Like people just, they get led astray because they don't, they don't know like what they're supposed to be doing based on these confusing narratives. Right. Well, thank goodness the, if you just go with the, um, the uh, mantra, which is my mantra, which is nature doesn't make bad fats, factories do. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's how you know. Nature doesn't make bad fats, factories do. And the, the, the thing is seed oil does come from seeds, but we don't get it on the scale if we don't use a factory. We don't get the toxins if we don't use a factory. People did used to use sesame seed and they completely different process than a factory. And sesame oil was relatively healthy. I mean, consumed in minute amounts because the seeds are minute. So they would have just a little bit of it. Um, the same with flax. So flax oil and flax seeds. Uh, flax seeds were used to make flax oil, um, but it wasn't like a staple. No one was living off the stuff. It was just mm-hmm. a little perk for f- different flavor from your in the animal fats that you would probably have as the vast, vast majority of your dietary fats. Got it. Dr. Kate, speaking about the fats, for you, when, with you and your husband, when you're cooking your meals, do you gravitate more towards the animal-based fats like tallow, lard, ghee? I know that they both have great smoke points. Or will you incorporate olive oil or avocado oil? Because I feel like people are very divided on that topic. So just curious how you feel about that. Well, they're divided because there's an confusion intentionally coming from people who need to sell lower quality oils. Hmm. So that's what smoke point is. That's a talking point around which you can sell people lower quality oils. The only way to get a high smoke point is to refine an oil. Hmm. Smoke point has nothing to do with your health. It has nothing to do with your health. But we use olive oil, we use butter, we use peanut oil because of the flavor. We use a little bit of sesame oil because of the flavor, it's delicious. And stir fry mm-hmm. mixed with peanut oil too, it's really, really good. Um, and, uh, and then that's mostly it. Like I don't have a lot of uses, frankly, for tallow just because we don't cook that way. We just don't do deep frying. We don't, like we use butter. Butter tastes better and we have butter. So um, that's what we use. But uh, you know, you could use tallow, but like we kind of use almost butter and olive oil almost interchangeably, just depending on what we want as a flavor, really. Hmm. Dr. Kate, where are you spending most of your time now? Where's, uh, where's most of your brain energy going towards these days? (laughs) Um, Well, mostly it's uh, towards helping, you know, being a doctor really, and just helping people not be sick anymore and get off this whole uh, disease, get out of, uh, escape the medical system, (laughs) really. yeah, so so I work one on one with people, and I work with patients in the uh, the you know the employees of um, of the company that I work for. But I'm also creating a lot of content so that people don't need to uh, work with me one on one because uh, there's a I, there's a lot of patterns that I've noticed over the years, and so I'm working on something that will help people with weight loss in the in a similar way to the way the fat burn fix works. I mean, it's basically kind of a programmatic approach to the fat burn fix. It's mm-hmm. just more spoon fed. Um, so, but until then the fat burn fix is cutting edge, <laughs> more cutting edge than anything else out there. <laughs> yeah. I've been, it seems like the last few years, there's almost been this awakening of uh, physicians and professionals in Western medicine that are, that are aware of just everything that's been going on in Western medicine over the last few decades and just a realization that, you know, things aren't the way that they should be. And there's just far too many people that are metabolically unhealthy. And there's been this shift where I, I've, I've connect, we both personally connect with a lot of doctors on Twitter that are trying to treat metabolic health and they've gone out on their own to set up their own telemedicine practices and have done all the hard work and invested in that to decentralize. Do you personally think that that trend is going to continue over the next few years? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I need to do more of that myself. So um, yeah, it's going to continue right here. <laughs> no. But it's the only way that doctors can really help people because we can't in the medical system. The, mm-hmm. the system is designed to, for the system's benefit, the hospital system, which includes the insurance, the health insurance. Like if you're using health insurance, you're probably not getting good advice on nutrition. Mm-hmm. 
And it takes a great deal of courage to break away from that too. I mean, you're basically accepting the fact that you're not going to be able to have customers who are uh, relying on insurance, right? Like they're private pay for the most part, right? Yeah. Right. I know it's really sad, but like I say, the, the alternative is that, you know, you could work for a company. So, mm. uh, but there's a lot of legal barriers in, in the way that like, um, you know, it's taken uh, this company that I work for several years to figure out how to navigate those because uh, I think it's by design, honestly, that they just don't want like the obvious solution is what this, uh, what I am is a company doc. A um, hundred years ago on when employers were plantations, like for example, mm -hmm. in Hawaii, where they had sugar cane plantations, mostly the, every sugar cane plantation had its own doctor and clinic. And, you know, that's mostly who did all, the vast, vast majority of medicine on the Island mm -hmm. because the companies wanted their employees to be able to get back to work. Yeah, so they just hired a doctor. Sense. Yeah, but now they've made that illegal or like functionally almost completely illegal in most states and in a few states, um, it's not illegal. So it's, it's, it's easier to do in some states than others, but um, it's still possible to do everywhere, but it, it's just, you have to know what you're doing and you have to know how to message it. Yeah, that's a lot of work too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Kate, do you ever get asked like, if you were to just kind of distill your overall philosophy on health and nutrition to a few points, whether it's like avoid seed oils, eat meat off the bone, um, incorporate a lot of good organ meats, you can influence your genes by nutrition. Like, are there, are there any, is there anything else that you would kind of add to that list for the listener just to, as, as we think about like wrapping this up and like summarizing our whole conversation? Yeah, I think that it's a really good question. It's a common question. And I used to answer it by, by like a list, mm -hmm. but then I realized that that's just, I'm just an expert. Like there's other people who will say the opposite, literally. Mm -hmm. They'll say that you need to eat nothing but plants or that seed oils are fantastic. So I think the, the real point, the real takeaway is that if you think nature is a pretty great thing, then that is something to focus on and hang on to and always go back to the question is, does this make sense from an ancestral perspective? Mm -hmm. so, right, because that's, that was our only tools was working with nature. Now we have technology, but our only tools that created us literally as a species uh, were our own intelligence, our own working with nature and uh, you know whatever comes from outer space or whatever deities you believe in that that helped out that process uh, there may be something out there but but it was you know literally the things that we ate that changed our physiology that is what i see in all of the historical record and all of the science that's available to us and it all comes from working with nature not against it so mm -hmm. if somebody's telling you that you need to have uh, something that's you know didn't exist before a hundred years ago you can go through a whole bunch of scientific conundrums to figure that out if it makes sense or you just ask this one question well if it didn't exist a hundred years ago um why was that mm -hmm. and if the answer is because it comes from a factory then that answers your question and that applies not just to seed oils, but seed oils are the worst. It also applies to protein powders. We did not consume protein powder. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kate, um, one of the things just before we head off, I'm curious to get your take on is sort of the ethical question around eating animals. I know this is probably the worst question to ask towards the end of an interview, but um, it's, <laughs> it's a heavy one. But how do you think about it? I mean, there's obviously a lot to unpack there, but like, what's your first reaction to that? You know, these days, the ethical question is twofold. It's like, are we killing a thing? Is that bad? And then the other thing is this idea that eating animals is bad for the planet, right? Mm, right. So both of those questions are really for, um, you know, philosophers and for people who understand ecology, right? So the bad for the planet question needs to be answered by people who understand ecology. 
Mm. Look at who are the ecological es- experts. What are they saying? And you know, I've looked at the, them, and you know, my answer, my interpretation of what they're saying is, we need a a um, ecosystem that has all it has always included animals. We right. never had monoculture. We never had GMOs. So there's your answer for that. Just the ecologist said that one. So that's that. So is it bad for the planet? I don't think so. Uh, that's not what's destroying the planet is eating animals. Um, but as you know, having people eat a healthy diet is not destroying the planet. Right. There's lots of other things that people do that are destroying the planet, but eating a healthy diet is not the main thing. So I think that's absurd. But then the ethical, the other side of the ethical question is like, can you take a life to give a life, right? Now that's the question that our spiritual leaders should be answering. Not me, but yeah. when, when you go to, who's, who's a great spiritual leader? Where, where I get my information is basically Joseph Campbell. Have you ever heard of him? Yes, I have not. Have you heard of Star Wars? Yes. <laughs> he was the guy that got zero credit for creating the characters of Star Wars. Mm. Like he is the brains behind the storyteller, George Lucas. He rewrote the whole thing. Mm-hmm. He created the characters. So he, he studied myth and, and like me, he was interested in common elements that, that people everywhere mm. shared because he felt it said something important about our psyche. So Joseph Campbell, and he said that when you have a functional religion, it answers this, that very question for you. That exact question is, you know, do you, what do you do? That's the, the he's, he calls, he's a great line. He's like, um, that, that is the fire or something about the fire. Like, do you feed the fire or do you pretend it doesn't exist? Right. And so our religions pretend most popular religion in this country kind of denies the whole question but the ancient religions and mythology they they talked about justification for killing an animal none of it makes any scientific sense but it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter it makes psychological sense it it takes care of that angst Mm -hmm. right like the buffaloes wanted to be killed that's basically what the native americans said like we made a deal with the buffaloes the dog the, he tells this story about that so yeah there's a, a um the it's called the power of myth it's a video series um joseph campbell uh uh did a lot of lectures going around the country and susan sarandon was involved she's very smart she's a buddhist i think um and uh she's like the host of the series and it was like on disc so you can probably get it anywhere you can get this but i recommend that because If you feel like uh, you need some spiritual grounding, well, that's where you get it. He's the expert. He's no one knows more than Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And any other um, books or or things that you would rely on uh, for people? Like if they are listening to this, you mentioned Weston A. Price's book, anything else that you've gotten a lot of value out of that people should go check out? Sure. Yes. And actually I have lists of my favorites in, in my books, but um, one of the other one, a sort of unspoken uh, secret great books is called a revolution in eating. Um, and it's like a deep dive into what people ate in America in the 15 and 1600s, you know, the founding fathers, what they actually ate and they were foodies, man. They were farmers. They were into food. There's letters between, um, Thomas Jefferson and the King of France, where Thomas Jefferson is bragging about like what a what great wildlife we have here and like how much bigger our squirrels are and stuff like that. I mean, they just it was food. They were talking about food all the time. That's so cool. <laughs> we love it. We love it. Um, Dr. Kate, what's the best way for people to connect with you just to learn more about what you're doing and see what you're up to and just kind of learn from all this knowledge that you have? So my website is drkate.com. So and that's D-R-C-A-T-E.com. And um, you can subscribe. I, 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 I write a newsletter about once a month or so on average, sometimes mm. more, sometimes less. But that's where you also kind of keep up with my Twitter feed there. You can follow me on Twitter too. I'm at Dr. Kate Shanahan on Twitter. And um, I'm also on Instagram, but they refused to give me a check. So uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with 
<laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I feel, I feel like Twitter, we talk about this a lot on the podcast. It's just a great way to interact with people. There's just the, the format of it. It's like you get insight into a way that other, the other people think that's honestly how the three of us got to connect off Twitter. Um, and I feel like Instagram just doesn't have that. It like Instagram lets you cast a wider net, but I think you can like really connect with your audience, uh, through this structure of Twitter. Yeah, I agree. It's like people are more, they create these personalities that, yes. um, I mean, they can hide behind it and it's, uh, it's cool. Exactly. Yeah. So, so for anyone listening, go check out Dr. Kate's website. It has so many good resources on it. I've, I think your seed oil article is a must read for anyone who's listening. So we will tag that in the show notes and um, Dr. Kate, thank you so much for coming on. This was great. It's amazing. Thank you for it was have fun having a conversation with you guys. You're very well informed. <laughs> it's, it's mostly from reading uh, work from people like yourself. So thank you. <laughs> It was a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks.